Margaret Barker is a Methodist preacher, mother of two, and a grandmother. She has published 16 books of biblical scholarship. She was awarded a Doctor of Divinity by the Archbishop of Canterbury in recognition of her work on the Jerusalem Temple and the origins of Christian liturgy, which has made a significantly new contribution to our understanding of the New Testament. Her book on creation, A Biblical Vision for the Environment, was given a forward by His Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew. Her work is primarily concerned with developing temple theology, which traces the roots of Christian theology back to the first temple. And I've noticed that those scholars who embrace her work do so because she makes a powerful case that the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith. Many scholars divide the two, but she makes a faith-affirming reconciliation. Uh, let's see, and then I'll just cut that part and go right here. Uh, now, we've been corresponding for a long time, and early on during our correspondence, Margaret sent me a copy of her a paper of, on wisdom, the Queen of Heaven, and asked me whether Mormons were interested in the topic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I sent her the text of Oh My Father, and uh, uh, she's written a 400-page book on the Mother of the Lord that adds much more light, and that's only volume one. One thing that should change after today is when you read DNC 1, inasmuch as they sought wisdom, they might be instructed. You'll never read that quite the same way again. Margaret. Well, as you gathered, Kevin and I have been emailing for many years and I've learned such a lot from him. So he's not exactly an unbiased introducer. It's lovely to be back here in Utah. I've just had a couple of days up in Logan, meeting with lots of old friends, seeing familiar faces, and now we've got to work. So I hope you've all got a copy of a handout. This is because I'm going to use a lot of biblical references and if you stop to write them down, you'll miss the next point. So all the biblical references I'm using in this paper are on the handout. And so if you want to go through it again, you will know that it's all there. What I'm going to do this morning is take you along a very old path. It's such an old path that some people don't even know it's there. And we're going to start with the mother in heaven in the book of Revelation, and we shall get back to the same lady at the end of the paper. So I'm going to read about the mother in heaven and her children. At the heart of the book of the Revelation, St. John sets the vision of a woman clothed with the sun, standing on the moon, and crowned with 12 stars. He described her as a sign in heaven. She gave birth to a son who was taken up to the throne of God. A great red dragon threatened the child, but the child escaped. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and drove them from heaven. The dragon took revenge and pursued the woman but she had great wings and fled from him into the desert. The dragon then went to attack her other children. St. John defined the children as those who kept the commandments of God and bore testimony to Jesus. Ah, I can't see my paper if it's as near as that. Okay. Um, elsewhere, he explained that the testimony of Jesus was what he saw, his visions. Now, nothing about the book of Revelation is simple or easy to understand. But this vision of the woman in heaven rewards careful attention to its details. First, the woman clothed with the sun was a mother in heaven who had more than one child. Her firstborn was a king, and the rest of her family were faithful followers of Jesus who kept the commandments of God. 
Her first child was the king described in Psalm 2. He shall rule the nations with a rod of iron. This shows that the vision recalled a ritual in the first temple, Solomon's temple, when the king from the house of David was enthroned. Second, the woman clothed with the sun was a queen. She wore a crown of stars and her son was the king. Third, she had been threatened by the great red dragon and so fled to the desert. She had been driven out of the temple in Jerusalem and she'd gone to the desert. Fourth, her children were the Christians. St. Paul said that Jesus was the firstborn among many children. In other words, that Jesus was the oldest of the woman's family. This is Romans 8. Here, there is clear evidence for the heavenly mother of the Christians. Some of the questions about the book of Revelation that cannot be answered are these. Where did the visions originate? And how old were they? St. John compiled them into the book of Revelation, but there are many signs that Jesus himself knew these visions and spoke about them to John and maybe to other disciples too. For example, when the 70 disciples returned from their mission and told Jesus that they really did have power over demons, Jesus exclaimed, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, Luke chapter 10. This is the vision in Revelation 12. Satan fell from heaven to earth after the woman's child had been taken up to heaven. So, did Jesus know the rest of the vision or just one part of it? It's likely that he knew the whole vision of the woman and her other children, and we shall come back to this later. The opening lines of the book of Revelation say this, a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. This is in effect the title of the book, and it says that these were the visions of Jesus. And the text continues, he made it known by sending his angel to his servant John. This means that the angel of the Lord inspired John to interpret the visions and maybe set them down in their present form. So, Jesus had seen Satan fall from heaven. He knew about his heavenly mother, the woman clothed with the sun. The dragon attacked the woman's other children, and John explained who they were. They kept the commandments of God, and they had the testimony of Jesus. Now, keeping the commandments might imply simply not breaking any of the Ten Commandments, but the word used, tereo, is quite strong and means to guard or preserve. It was used in the Greek Old Testament to translate the word natsar. This word too was sometimes used to mean just keeping the commandments. So you have Psalm 78, they shall guard or preserve his commandments. But it was also used to describe a particular group of faithful people with Israel who were preserved or guarded. And so we have Psalm 31, the lo love the Lord, all you his saints, the Lord guards or preserves, that's the word, the Lord guards or preserves the faithful. Or Isaiah 27, I, the Lord, guard or preserve the pleasant vineyard. I guard and preserve it day and night. The role of a mysterious figure called the servant of the Lord Isaiah writes about him quite a lot, was to restore the faithful, those who were the guarded and preserved ones. 
and this means that at some stage they were driven out. There are four poems in the book of Isaiah that describe the servant of the Lord. They are now incorporated into the second section of the book, which some people think was added by a later disciple of the prophet. But the four servant poems, I'm pretty certain, come from the original prophet. So they were written in the late 8th century BC and reused in the mid 6th century. Isaiah said that the servant was called to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the guarded or the preserved of Israel. Or perhaps it means to restore the guardians and preservers of Israel. I say perhaps because there are problems with the Hebrew text at this point. It could mean the preserved of Israel or the preservers of Israel. And it is important to note that a text about these preservers, those who were driven out, is now uncertain. And this is something we shall see quite a lot. The way markers on this path have often been, shall we say, tampered with. The Hebrew word for Christians is this same word, the notesreem, literally the preservers. And in the Jewish Talmud, Jesus was called the notesri. This is sometimes thought to be just another form of Nazareth, but Jesus, the man was from Nazareth, and his followers were the Nazarenes. But this is not so. The word is Nazorian with an O in the middle, not Nazarian with an A, and it means the guardians and preservers. St. John, who was an eyewitness, said that the words on Jesus' cross were Jesus the Nazorene, Jesus the preserver or the restorer, the king of the Jews, not Jesus of Nazareth. The other children of the woman clothed with the sun were also the guardians and preservers. They kept the commandments of God. They had the testimony of Jesus. In other words, they knew the visions of Jesus, what he saw. And so the children of the Heavenly Mother were preserving the older ways, and Isaiah knew that they had been driven out, but would be restored. One of the Dead Sea Scrolls describes a group who decided to return to the older ways. The Damascus document, as it is called, told of people who recognized that their nation had been unfaithful and so the Lord had hidden his presence from them and from his temple. This was the beginning of the Age of Wrath. At some time during the Age of Wrath, not at the beginning, but during the Age of Wrath, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon destroyed Jerusalem, and 390 years after that, according to the Damascus document, this group withdrew from Jerusalem to live again according to the old ways. The text is enigmatic, and so we have to guess what underlies the words. These people went to live in a land that they called Damascus. We're not sure where that was. So much of this Dead Sea text is coded, and so we have to guess. The Lord revealed to these people the hidden things in which their people had gone astray, and they called themselves the members of the New Covenant. This was one group in the time of Jesus, there may have been others, who withdrew from Jerusalem to live according to the old ways, as they were before the beginning of the Age of Wrath. They may have been the children of the Heavenly Mother, although this is not mentioned. But in the vision in Revelation, the woman clothed with the sun fled to the desert where she was kept safe. The group that said they lived in Damascus 
suggests they were the people St. Paul went to arrest. This is the Acts chapter 9. And like the Christians, they called themselves the people of the new covenant. The Damascus document also gives a clue as to the time when the people of Israel went astray and began to change the old ways. It was not when Jerusalem was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, but some time before that. Isaiah's poems about the servant were composed at least a century before Jerusalem was destroyed, and they depicted the servant restoring the preservers of Israel. This suggests that Isaiah knew that Israel had gone astray by the middle of the 8th century BC. Our quest now is to find how and why the people went astray. In his vision of the Lord enthroned in the temple when he was called to be a prophet, this is Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah recognized that he lived among a people of unclean lips and that he had not spoken out against this. Unclean lips meant wrong teaching, and so this was probably how he described his people going astray. The prophet Micah was a contemporary of Isaiah. He prophesied that an unnamed woman would give birth to the great shepherd ruler. The Lord would give up his people until the time of his birth, and then the remnant of his brothers would return. This is Micah chapter 5. But Micah also described how a woman, and we assume she was the great shepherd's mother, how this woman was dragged violently from the city. But he prophesied, Micah chapter 4, that she would return. He called this woman daughter Zion, and he said that she would return to her kingdom in Jerusalem. Micah knew this woman as the queen who had ruled in Jerusalem, and she would return. Recall now that the vision in the book of Revelation of the woman clothed with the sun was crowned with stars. She appeared in the heavenly temple, she gave birth to her royal son, and then she had to flee into the desert on great wings like those of an eagle. The royal seal of the kings of Judah and Jerusalem in the time of Isaiah was a sun with wings. This is not, as is often said, an image of the sun king, but of his mother, the winged woman clothed with the sun, who was driven out. But she was not forgotten. Malachi, writing in the time of the second temple when the priesthood was corrupt and the temple polluted, knew that the mother would return. But the prophet's words are not translated accurately in modern English versions. The natural way to read them is, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in her wings, Malachi chapter 4. The winged mother would return and heal. Healing was one of her roles. What we cannot know is this. Does the vision of the dragon attacking the women's other children depict their persecution only in the time of Jesus and St. John? Or does it recall the persecution of her children many centuries earlier when they were first driven out. So now we know that we are looking for the heavenly mother of the king in writings from the first temple period, and many texts come to mind. First, there is Isaiah's Emmanuel prophecy. When Jerusalem was in danger, threatened by a coalition of enemies from the north, Isaiah met King Ahaz and assured him that the royal house would continue, he would have a son and heir. And this is the famous prophecy we read at Christmas. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, Isaiah chapter 7. 
This was the heavenly mother of the future king, not just the human woman who would bear the child. She was the mother in heaven, also present in her earthly manifestation. She was called in the Hebrew, the virgin, not a virgin or even a young woman. Isaiah was speaking of a known figure whose title was the Virgin, Haralma. The title implies someone who is hidden or someone in eternity. This was also a title in Ugarit, a neighboring culture to the north of Israel that had flourished a few centuries earlier. The title was given to divine or royal persons such as the Queen Mother. And this was also the case in Jerusalem. The Virgin was the Mother in Heaven, and her Son on Earth was called God with us, Emmanuel, showing that Mother and Son were believed to be both divine and human. This belief could still be found many centuries later. Origen, the Christian biblical scholar who died in 253, said that John the Baptist was an angel and a man at the same time. He was an angel on earth. Origen referred to an apocryphal text currently used by the Hebrews, which he called the prayer of Joseph. And this explained that Jacob the patriarch was also the angel Israel who stood in the presence of God. Thus, said Origen, the Christians recognized that John the Baptist was more than just a man. He was an angel who would appear before the Lord returned, just as the prophet Malachi had said. In the same way, the mother in heaven and her son in First Temple Jerusalem were also the queen mother on earth and her son the king. In the vision of the woman clothed with the sun, her male child was set on the throne of God. This shows where the mother in heaven gave birth to her child. The lady was seen in the Holy of Holies. St. John says that the ark was seen when the temple in heaven was opened and the pregnant woman appeared as a sign now, since the ark was kept in the Holy of Holies, behind the veil in the first temple, this means that the veil had been drawn aside and John saw the hidden woman giving birth to her son. Now, remember, there was no ark in the second temple. So a vision that includes the ark is set in the first temple. The woman bore her son in the Holy of Holies of the First Temple. Isaiah described the heavenly birth of the new king, and again, this is a familiar Christmas Bible reading. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, Isaiah chapter nine. The familiar words were the song of angels in the Holy of Holies when the new king was born. Now there are other texts about this ritual birth in the Holy of Holies. Psalm 110, for example, described the birth of the king. But the key verse here is now damaged. Material about the mother in heaven and her children, there is a suspiciously large number of damaged text. You will recall that Isaiah's text about the preservers of Israel is also damaged. The key verse is Psalm 110, verse three. Scholars have to reconstruct as best they can with the help of the old Greek translation of the verse, but there is still no agreement. The authorized version, the old King James Version, 
translates it like this. Thy people will be willing on the day of thy power in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning thou hast the dew of thy youth. Well, that's not a terribly clear translation of anything. The old Greek, well, it's worth looking sometimes at these translations and saying, what does that mean? The old Greek is, with you is rule on the day of your power in the glory of the holy ones from the womb before morning star I have begotten you. Well, that's not much better. There are many problems, and I shall mention only four. Your youth in that verse, in the Hebrew, becomes, I have begotten you, in the Greek. But this is just another way to read the same Hebrew letters. You just pronounce the word differently with different vowels. That's a perfectly acceptable way to read that piece of Hebrew. Now, the second, the day of your power, can also mean the day of your birth, because the two Hebrew words are the same. Written the same, pronounced differently. The beauties of holiness can also be translated the splendid garments of a holy one. Thy people became with you in Greek, and neither makes very much sense. The, birth, the verse is actually about the king's heavenly birth. I have begotten you, the day of your birth, and he has the splendid garments of a holy one. But where is his mother? I suggest that she has been lost in the word now translated your people or with you. One letter has changed. The Hebrew letter Aleph has become a Hebrew letter Ayin. They're very similar. You just need to either add or remove one little leg in one corner. Written with an Aleph, the word is your mother. Not your people, your mother. And the difficult word that follows is then to be read, she offers you graciously. And so the two difficult Hebrew words become your mother offers you graciously rather than your people are willing. So the whole line probably was on the day of your birth, your mother graciously offered you the splendid garments of a holy one. So the mother in heaven clothed her child with a glorious temple garment. And that is another example of a damaged text about the mother in heaven and her son. There was strong pressure to remove the mother from the temple during the later years of the first temple. The movement had its first real success in the time of Isaiah, and when he was called to be a prophet, he recognized that he lived among a people of unclean lips. There were other attempts to remove her until finally King Josiah purged the temple in 623 BC. The Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem a few years later. Refugees from Josiah's purges and the Babylonian war took with them memories of the mother who had once protected them. The book of Jeremiah describes some refugees in Egypt who blamed the destruction of Jerusalem on Josiah removing the mother from the city. Reading now from Jeremiah. Uh, when we venerated the queen of heaven, we had plenty of food and prospered and saw no evil. But since we left off burning incense to the queen of heaven, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. In other texts, we find the mother with her title of wisdom. Here in the book of Proverbs chapter one, she calls out to her foolish children when they had rejected her. How long, O oh simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing? 
and fools hate knowledge. Give heed to my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit upon you. It was the lady, the mother, wisdom, who poured out the spirit on her children. The refugees who settled in Egypt never forgot the mother. Later writings from that community enable us to reconstruct something about her. The people who built the second temple in Jerusalem, however, did not restore her, although the people themselves did not forget her. The scribes who collected and transmitted the Hebrew texts that eventually became the Old Testament made several alterations to the text to remove any reference to her. They called this straightening or putting right the text, and the changes that they made are called the tikkune sofarim, the corrections of the scribes. They worked to remove anything that later generations considered blasphemous, and so many passages about the mother and her son were changed. Sometimes it was only by prescribing a new way to pronounce the words, but sometimes the letters themselves were changed. I suspect that the true extent of this putting right has not yet been recognized. It certainly explains why so many texts dealing with the mother and her son are now damaged or very difficult to read. Here are a few examples. The text about the mother clothing her son with a glorious garment on the day of his birth is very damaged indeed. The word mother has disappeared completely just by changing one letter. A similar change of letter from an aleph to ayin also happened in Isaiah chapter 7 verse 11, just before the prophecy, Behold, the virgin shall conceive. The original Hebrew was, Ask a sign from the mother of the Lord your God. This is what the great Isaiah scroll that was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls actually says. The sign from the mother of the Lord was the virgin giving birth. The prophet Ezekiel described a statue in the temple. This is at the very end of the first temple period. The Hebrew text now says it was an image of a woman that causes jealousy or trouble. Ezekiel chapter 8. But the original was an image of the woman who creates. By adding one silent letter, a silent letter, an aleph, she was changed from an image of the mother into an image of someone that caused a lot of trouble. Although Deuteronomy chapter 32 doesn't mention the mother, this is an old poem about the sons of God. But in the present Hebrew text, they became the sons of Israel. And that bit of the poem no longer makes any sense. But the original sons of God survived in the old Greek translation, where they became angels of God. And they are still clearly there in a fragment of Deuteronomy chapter 32 that was found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jesus ben Sirach wrote a book of wisdom teaching about 200 BC. He lived in Jerusalem, and he shows that the mother and her children were not forgotten in his time. He called her wisdom, and this is what he taught about her disciples. Wisdom will meet them like a mother, and like the wife of his youth, she will welcome him, she will feed him with the bread of understanding and give him the water of wisdom to drink. That's Ben Sirach 15. He also compared wisdom to the glorious garment worn by the high priest. And this is Ben Sirach chapter 6. You will wear her like a glorious robe and you will put her on like a crown of gladness. This is a translation of the old Greek text. But where the, when the Hebrew text was discovered, about a hundred years ago, just over, 
the imagery of the high priest's clothing was even more striking. Wisdom the mother was a weaver, and she made a glorious garment for her child. So now we know we're looking for a heavenly weaver, and we go back through the text to see if we can find the heavenly mother and her weaving. Now, there is a poem about wisdom in the creation in Proverbs chapter 8. She was beside the creator as he worked. One word at the beginning of this poem has caused problems. Was she hidden away at the beginning or was she set up at the beginning? What does this word mean? There are many different translations but the word itself is actually quite clear. The Hebrew says she was weaving. But modern translators haven't even considered this as a possibility because they're not looking for the mother in heaven who weaves. And so the original line actually says still, from eternity I was weaving, from the first, from the beginning of the earth. The same problem is found in Psalm 2, which again describes the ritual birth of her son. The Lord speaks and says that he has set his king on Zion, his holy hill. But set here is a very unusual way to translate the Hebrew verb nasak, which elsewhere means to weave. And it may, in fact, mean that the newborn king was wrapped in a woven garment and then set on Zion, his holy hill. There are many other examples, but we've only got less than an hour. I've not got you here for a week. So I'm going to move on now to some early Christian evidence. First, there is a book of early Christian teaching attributed to Sylvanus that was being used in the early 4th century. Part of it was included in the writings of St. Anthony, who died in 356. So we know it was used by mainstream Christians. In 1945, the complete text of this was discovered in Egypt and it shows that the early Christians knew all about the Heavenly Mother making a garment for her children. I'm quoting a little bit now from this text. Return, my son, to your first father, God, and to wisdom, your mother. Wisdom summons you in her goodness, saying, Come to me, all of you, O foolish ones, that you may receive a gift the understanding which is good and excellent. I am giving you a high priestly garment that is woven from every wisdom. Clothe yourself with wisdom like a robe. Put knowledge upon you like a crown. Be seated upon a throne of perception. From now on, my son, return to your divine nature. The mother in heaven called her children back to her and to their divine nature. She gave them a high priestly garment woven from wisdom. Second, there was a gospel used by the Hebrew Christians that has been lost except for a few fragments preserved in other writings. One passage was quoted by Origen. That was the scholar who explained that John the Baptist was both a man and an angel. This Gospel of the Hebrews had Jesus calling the Holy Spirit his mother. For example, my mother, the Holy Spirit, took me and carried me to the great mountain Tabor. St. Jerome, writing about 400 AD, also knew the Gospel of the Hebrews. And in his commentary on Isaiah, he quoted this Gospel's account of Jesus' baptism. When the Lord had come up out of the water, the whole fount of the Holy Spirit descended and rested upon him and said to him, my son, in all the prophets, I was waiting for you that you should come that I might rest in you. For you are my rest, you are my firstborn son, 
and you reign forever. So as late as 400, the Christians knew that Jesus had a heavenly mother. She was sometimes called the Holy Spirit. She was also called wisdom. He was her firstborn, which incidentally is also a title for the king in the first temple, for example, in Psalm 89. So far, we haven't looked very much at the New Testament, apart from the mysterious vision of the woman clothed with a sun. One problem we encounter when looking for the mother as the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is that in Greek, spirit is a neuter noun, whereas, of course, in Hebrew, it's feminine. And so modern translators choose to translate what should be it from the Greek as he or him. And so the mother imagery is completely lost. Thus, for Romans 8.16, the Jerusalem Bible, the Revised Standard Version, the New English, have the Spirit himself. The New Revised Standard obviously recognized the problem and avoided the phrase, but the older versions are accurate. William Tyndale, for example, has the same Spirit, and the King James has the Spirit itself. But St. Paul is here explaining that all who are led by the Spirit become children of God, so that Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. This is what we've got in Revelation 12. The Christians led by the Spirit are the other children of the woman clothed with the sun. There is another translation problem that has obscured the mother and her children. But this time it's not the modern translators, but the difficulty of rendering the subtleties of Hebrew into Greek. Jesus almost certainly did not teach in Greek. And so all his sayings in the New Testament are already translated. And there is a difficulty with his saying about wisdom and her children. We find two versions of this, one in Luke 7, one in Matthew 11. Wisdom is justified by all her children. Wisdom is justified by all her deeds. But how is wisdom justified? The Greek word represents the Hebrew word tzadok. And this in turn has many shades of meaning. In some forms, it meant to put right or even to heal. In others, it meant to be vindicated or proved correct. In this saying of Jesus, it could have meant that wisdom, who had been rejected, was vindicated by her children and their deeds. Or it could have meant that wisdom did her work of healing and putting right through all her children and their deeds. One thing is certain, though, Jesus knew of wisdom and her children. St. Luke also knew about the mother in heaven and her son and how she gave birth to him in the Holy of Holies and wrapped him in a glorious garment. When he told the nativity story, he told it so as to recall the temple tradition of the heavenly birth. He emphasized four details. This is Luke chapter 2, very familiar Christmas story. Mary was a virgin who gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him around. This, of course, implies swaddling clothes. She laid him in a manger. He mentioned the swaddling clothes or the wrapping around twice. He mentions the manger three times. The virgin and her firstborn son is a clear reference to the old temple ritual for the birth of the king. Wrapping a garment around the child was wisdom's garment for her son. But what about the manger? And here there is wordplay that was characteristic of old temple discourse, especially in wisdom teaching. This could be very complex. It was also very clever. In Hebrew, the word for a manger is avus. The old name for Jerusalem or Zion was yebus. They sound very similar. 
and whoever told this story to St. Luke knew this. Mary had wrapped her son in a garment and set him on Yebus. It's a clear echo of Psalm 2, verse 6, as we propose to read it. I have put my king in a woven garment upon Zion, my holy hill. This was the birth of the mother's firstborn. But St. Paul said that Jesus was the firstborn among many children, and the woman clothed with the sun had other offspring. What of them? St. Luke records this too. Before Jesus was taken up to heaven, he said to his disciples, this is Luke 24, stay in the city until you are clothed, and it is literally the word clothed, with power from on high. This was the garment woven from every wisdom that Sylvanus knew was given to the children of wisdom. Now there's much, much more material, but I don't have the time. I hope this has been enough to show you that the mother in heaven was a central figure in the Old Testament. Over many generations, there was pressure to remove her, but we don't know why. Isaiah recognized that removing her had led to false teaching. The refugees who eventually fled from Jerusalem took with them their old faith and did not forget her. They were the preserved and the preservers of Israel, whom the servant of the Lord would restore. Tribe, scribes in the Second Temple era tried to remove from the Hebrew texts all memory of the mother and her son, and modern translators have continued their work by not translating accurately even what remains. Malachi did not prophesy that the son of righteousness would rise with healing in his wings. Isaiah did not prophesy that a young woman would give birth to a son. He spoke of the virgin. And the refugees in Egypt remembered this when they translated Isaiah into Greek. And so we end where we began. The path has come full circle. But by now we know why the woman clothed with the sun is at the center of the book of Revelation. And we know who she is and who her children are. Thank you. In time. Am I a child of this heavenly mother? If yes, is this symbolic or literal? I think when you're talking religious talk, you don't really separate like that. Yes, we are all children of the heavenly mother. Who is the mother of the non-Christians? That's a very difficult one. I suspect she too, and they've got to rediscover their mother. Um, Deary me, can't do this handwriting. Um, is Nazarene an intentional pun on Nazarene? Um, not all the Gospels claim he is from Nazareth, if I recall correctly. I can't run all that through my mind now. All I can say for certain is that what John wrote on the cross had an O in the middle, and that in itself is enough to bring us up short and make us read the text carefully. Um, could you discuss the winged sun as an image of the divine goddess? Well, the answer is not in 30 seconds, but it's certainly there. That is the image of the king. And you find the same winged sun also in some Ugaritic um, engravings where she is hovering over the king and so forth. So it's um, quite an important figure. And of course, she is the winged sun in Revelation chapter 12. Um, do you believe the Holy Ghost is our mother in heaven? And the answer is yes. Um, is there any relationship between the Heavenly Mother and the Holy Spirit? Yes, another name for the same lady. Should the traditional concept of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit include her? Well, it does. Um, why, in your opinion, is there not more scriptures revealed about the Mother in Heaven? Well, there is a lot more in the scriptures once we translate them correctly, and once we try to undo the work of those people who call themselves the correcting scribes. This is something that some scholars are working on. I'm one of them at the moment. 
it's a big job. It's not something you can rush and do in a week because you are proposing that there have been changes in scripture. That's not something you do lightly, but there is a lot of evidence. How do the scriptures uh, support the idea of the Lady of the Temple being mortally represented by Mary? This you need to go into the very earliest Christian traditions about Mary. Um, if you look at the early Byzantine hymns to Mary, the liturgies about Mary, every one, and I mean every one, of the titles for Mary comes from the temple tradition of the Mother in Heaven. Why is the Mother in Heaven a doctrinal threat for modern Christianity? Whoever said it was. Um, what is the... The Age of Wrath. This was the time when the people or some of the people who had moved away from mainstream Judaism, like the Qumran people, they said this was the time when things started going wrong for Israel. This was the time when God turned his face away. Um, oh, thank you. I loved your talk. Bless you. Um, crumbs. Strong's Concordance makes no connection to the preservers. It merely identifies. Strong's Concordance makes no connection of Nazarius to the preservers. It merely identifies the word as another translation of Nazarite. How would you reconcile this with your research? Well, go to my website, and on it there is a paper about Jesus the Nazarian. Um, I think it's nine, 2014. My website is simply my name, one string and you'll find something there about that. Um, how do you distinguish between references to the mother in heaven and the mother of God, as, as the mother of God, and, and Mary? Um, it's probably quite radical, but I suspect that the idea that Mary is the manifestation of this heavenly mother is what the original Christians thought. Now, that's obviously a very big one to drop on anybody, but especially sort of early in the morning. But I think we've got to look at these, these references, we've got to look at carefully and take them seriously. And if we look at Jesus as a heavenly being incarnate, what about his mum? So there are two virgins, a spiritual and a physical. Um, yes, except that in Hebrew thinking, you don't distinguish between the two. That's very important to remember. There weren't two John the Baptists pottering around. They recognized that he lived in heaven and on earth. We pray, don't we, on earth as it is in heaven. Um, does Sophia wisdom in the Nag Hammadi texts relate at all to the mother in the New and Old Testaments. Now, the whole question of Sophia in the Nag Hammadi texts and various other names for the lady, like Barbelo, that is a very, very complicated issue. I've written a little bit about it in volume one of The Mother of the Lord. Volume two, which is still, as they say, in progress, um, we'll have more about that, but at the moment, the progress is rather slow. Um, do you regard the mother in heaven as Mary in the New Testament or someone different who is a companion of God the Father? Um, the mother in heaven, I think the early Christians saw her as manifested in Mary. This is the same uh, picture as we've had before. Um, Mary was certainly honored by the Christians from a very early stage. Um, can you address the tradition, Catholic, uh, that Mary, when young, was one of the weavers of the temple veil? Oh, well, that's a lovely one. Of course, had I a whole day with you, we could have done that. Mary, we are told specifically, was a weaver. She wove the veil of the temple. The veil of the temple, in temple symbolism, uh, signified matter because it, it screened the glory of God from human eyes. And coming right through into medieval Christian tradition, the high priest's robe that is made of the same fabric as the veil represented the presence of the Lord wrapped in matter, in other words, incarnation. So the early Christians who told the story of Mary as the weaver and the veil, they knew this mother in heaven and weaving and wrapping her around her child. We've heard this tradition is... Um, Sorry? Visiting Israel and the recent Catholic movie about Mary. You've heard this tradition when you were visiting Israel. Well, good. You went with a good tour group. And 
a recent Catholic movie about Mary. Well, quite possibly. It's actually in something called The Infancy Gospel of James, and you can find that online and read it, and it's a lovely story, early Christian story. It is, incidentally, the Bodmer V papyrus of this gospel is the oldest complete gospel that we have, so it's not something late and to be discarded. So go online and Google Gospel of James and you'll find it. Um, is there evidence for this in more than a tradition? A tradition? Um, that's very difficult because a lot of the early Christian writings incorporate tradition and on the principle of no smoke, no fire, it's important not to dismiss little bits and also to remember that they reported what was symbolically significant. So the fact that we are told that Mary was a weaver, we're not told anything about how she cooked or, anything, or kept house, but she was a weaver. We needed to know that. Um, so is it your belief that the Holy Spirit is a feminine being? The Holy Spirit is feminine, yes. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, when studying the Bible, how does one determine when wisdom refers to the Divine Mother or the traditional concept of wisdom. This is very difficult. Does wisdom have a capital W or a small one? Um, I think a capital W in far more places than is usually recognized. And in most cases, of course, no capital Ws are recognized at all. So there's a lot of undoing to do there. I don't think she is a late philosophical concept that somehow got in. Uh, I think we've got a lot of re-reading, re-studying, and looking at old scholarship on wisdom and putting it in the museum of scholarship. We've moved on. Oh, goodness me. Right. Um, was Jesus a twin? Answer, had no idea, and there's no evidence on that at all. So to be clear, Mary was was and is our heavenly mother, Mary the Virgin. She is the earthly manifestation of what the early Christian saw as the woman clothed with the sun who gives birth to the Messiah in the book of Revelation. Um, can you expand upon the mother weeping and being comforted by a pre-mortal spirit when Satan fell from heaven? I don't recognize that. Is that in your scriptures? I don't, no. sorry, I don't recognize that. Well, whoever um, asked that question, find me afterwards and we'll talk about the, it. Uh, signing books in the back. The yeah, books. okay. The rabbis say the word is not virgin, but young woman in the Hebrew Bible. Yes, well, they would, wouldn't they? Um, <laughs> now, this is where you have to do a simple process of counting. The old Greek was translated before the time of Christianity. And that says clearly Parthenos, virgin. After the advent of Christianity, the mainstream Jews, those who didn't become Christians, realized that the old Greek translation was no longer accurate. So how had the Hebrew changed, we ask ourselves. And during the second century, three new Greek translations were made and Origen, of course, the working in the middle of the, well, the early part of the third century, made a comparison of all these things. So we've got quite a lot of evidence that survives. The post-Christian translations that did not like what the Christians were doing with that proof text all say young woman. The pre-Christian translation, which the post-Christian Jew said was no longer accurate, that was changed. But the people who chose to translate Galma as Parthenos were those who were keeping alive the tradition of the mother in Egypt. It's modern political correctness, that's being kind, it could just be ignorance, that leads people to translate um, as young woman. And it's not a virgin, it's the virgin. There is a definite article, there's, there's no question of that. Um, did she also... Did she also aid in weaving the first veil of the temple? That's very interesting because one of the great purges, one of the things that King Josiah removed from the temple, when he purged everything, he, it was like a Protestant Reformation. And one of the targets of his reforming zeal was to remove everything to do with the lady. 
including driving out the young women who were the temple weavers. Now, that's very interesting. That's something that would be very interesting to pursue. That is a work in progress. But certainly, weaving is associated with the lady and the mother in heaven. She weaves the fabric of creation, um, the high priest's garments. Her golden light is woven through the fabric that represents creation. So the high priest wears a garment that represents the golden light of heaven shot through the fabric of creation. But that is, really is another session. Thank you so much. Right.